interaction feature. Now we remember how we wrote H. So H is equal to H0 plus V. Hmm? Now H0 commutes with H0 and it simplifies this term. So we have that this is equal to E to the I H0 T V E to the minus I H0 T psi So we found the, the, time of the, the time evolution of the state in the interaction field. So we have the time evolution. Now you see that it satisfies the same equation as before. So it's like a shading equation. But now this operator here depends on the time. As you pointed out before, that what happens now? Can we, can we write uh, formally the solution to this equation? Yes, we can. You already know how to do it. I tell you. So, okay, first of all, let's write here just to complete the, uh, this scheme. So, what, what is the solution? Interaction picture. We have that the, the state time evolved is according to this equation. So, we have the uh, i time derivative of psi interaction picture of t is equal to this e to the i h0 t b e to the minus i h0 t psi t interaction mm -hmm. and the observables evolve according to this equation the interaction t is equal to o t interaction h0 Let's write H here. Hmm. Well, the, we have the three standard pictures hmm, where we can study time evolution in quantum mechanics. Okay, uh, indeed, just uh, sp let's spend a few just a few words on this because maybe you are less familiar with uh, with the time evolution in the presence of uh, Hamiltonian with the time dependence. Hmm. What is the solution to that, to that equation? So, so you can uh, if you write <coughs> psi t, for example, interaction picture as some time evolution operator apply to the state at initial time. Mm -hmm. This is an I. Okay. Oh, this is an I interaction. Okay. Then what you can prove is that you can write this time evolution operator as a sum from n that goes from zero to infinity. You can write a series of uh, this form, uh, like u v, I don't know if I use it, so u n, that is like of t, u of t, u n of t, mm -hmm. where u, u1, u0 of t is just equal to the identity, and u n of t is equal to uh, minus i integral from 0 to t of u n minus 1 of tau. This is a claim. So you have this equation, and now I'm telling you that you can express always the time evolution this way. 
How, how can you prove it? Well, you just take the derivative, the time derivative of this object, and then you realize when you take the time derivative of un, you find un minus 1 every time. The only exception is u0, where you find 0. Then if you then take all the, well, all the derivatives, you realize that the, actually it satisfies this equation, u i t is equal to that operator, e to the i h 0 t u v, e to the minus i h 0 t u i of t. And so, the, so we found the, the time evolution operator also for this case, also in this case. This is just okay because maybe you are less familiar with this, so know that you can have the prior solution of in this when there is a time dependence in the Hamiltonian, and this is the, the formal solution. Maybe you can find in books, whatever, you can find a, a, a compact notation, and we generally write this in, this in the following form. So we write that uh, given a, <clears throat> a time evolution with a time dependent Hamiltonian. We, we say that this solution, the one that I wrote here, can be written in this form as the time order operator of the exponential of minus i integral from 0 to t, the tau of h of tau, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. this is just a, a compact notation for this, for what I wrote. A generic, uh, yeah, this is for a generic Hamiltonian. Okay, here we consider the, this particular case, but you can, uh, well, this is a general theorem, well, but you, you can prove it immediately, you know. It's not a very complicated theorem, it's a lemma. Yeah? What's the theory of that What's the meaning? Uh, okay, this, this is, in the, I don't want to enter into the details now. Let's just consider this is just a compact, uh, compact notation to denote this one, what I wrote below, so it's not really important. Okay, T is, a, is an operator that order the operator in, in uh, uh, is a super operator that orders the operator uh, depending on the time. So from the uh, larger times to the, to the shorter times. Okay, but the, it's not really important. Okay, so this is just, uh, yeah. Ui, it's yes, it's the same. Okay. okay, this was just to present you different uh, formalism to describe time evolution. They are completely equivalent. The problem is the same. So we are interested in the expectation values of uh, expectation values, and we can use one of these, or even others. If you, if you, if you would like to, if you prefer, for example, you could prefer to. To, to consider a, uh, some kind of a strange interaction feature when you want to apply H0 to the state instead of the operator. Well, why not? You can do the same and uh, you, you, you describe your time evolution in a slightly different way with different equations, and, okay? Okay, so uh, well, what about the general properties of time evolution in quantum mechanics? Let's consider this. So in particular, let's assume the, now the Hamiltonian is independent of the time, and, uh, okay, and uh, we, we are interested in the expectation values of some observable. Oh. Mm. Or maybe just, okay. Uh, let's, let's consider just the state, the time evolution of a state in the Schrodinger pitch. For example, we have e to the minus i h t psi zero. Now we can uh, write the state in the basis that diagonalizes the Hamiltonian. Hmm? Okay, it's convenient because we are applying here the the, uh, the Hamiltonian to the state. So it could be convenient here to insert some n identity, which is just a sum over all the state 
of the projector on the eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. Let's assume now that we have a discrete spectrum. So we can do something like this. So what you find here, you find that this is equal to the sum over all the eigenstates of e to the minus i e n uh, e n t uh, times the overlap between the state and the excited state corresponding to this energy, psi, zero, and, uh, and here you have the x -ray. Okay. I just inserted this identity. This is one. This is equal to one. This is one. This is the identity in the, in the space, the other space. So, uh, what do we learn from this expression now? Well, let's assume that we have a finite number of, uh, of states. Your, our, uh, uh, our space is, uh, is finite, like, for example, a spin chain. Spin chain with a fi uh, fixed number of spins. Hmm. So this means that this sum is up to some capital N. Hmm. But if you want to think about spin chains, let's write the two to the capital N. That would be. So, are there some general properties that we can infer just from this expression? Yes, okay. First of all, we notice that uh, if we just consider the contribution from a given eigenstate of this, okay? Because, okay, the, the, uh, the time appears only, only in this space, so this means that for the single contribution, we can immediately see that the, uh, this contribution is periodic with a period which is equal to a period that, uh, period t, which is 2 pi over yen for given n. Because every time that you, uh, if you add this, this capital T to this term, then you find that uh, you are multiplying this space by e to the 2 pi i, which is equal to 1. So the single contribution is periodic. OK, but here we have many, many contributions. No? And, uh, but what happens instead if we, if you have, for example, that uh, the strange situation where all these uh, excitation energies are in a rational ratio. So let's assume that E to the N over E M is a rational number. Hmm? Rational number means it can be written uh, like the ratio of two integers, P and Q, where P and Q are integer. Let's assume that we are in this condition. Then, is there something that we can infer from this expression? Why quasi? In this case, it's really periodic. It's periodic because if you now consider all this ratio here, and then you consider the, okay, uh, the you can always find the, a, you can always find the time, which is proportional to the product of all the denominators here, yeah. in these numbers, after which the, the, you, you, uh, you reconstruct the initial state. So in this condition, there is, actually there are infinite in many times, times t tilde, such that psi of t tilde is exactly equal to psi zero. The system is periodic. Here, for, for any, if you, let's assume that the, the entire spectrum has this property. You pick two generic uh, energies and you always find uh, this. Uh, what? Yes, for the finite spectrum. Finite spectrum, and then let's assume that we have this kind of symmetry, strange symmetry in our system. And then we find that this is periodic. We already know this kind of system. If you consider a single oscillator, okay? Is it true that we have infinitely many eigenstates? But and if you if you remove the one half uh, omega, the the energy of the ground state, mm -hmm. and then you realize that the all the ratio of the uh, excited states uh, are rational numbers. So for these states, you you see that there is always this time, which is very large, it can be very large because it, uh, you should consider that here you are we are taking into account two to the capital n uh, states. So these denominators can be very, very large. 
And so there is a very, very large time after which you, uh, you reconstruct the initial state. Clearly, you, can, you cannot expect that, uh, to have this kind of relation in generic system, in, uh, also in the easy model, if you don't have this relation. So if you consider the ratio of two energies, you find something which is not rational. Nevertheless, you, you can approximate real numbers with rational numbers. Okay. So what happens is, uh, as long as the number of states is finite, you can always say that the system is quasi-periodic. So you, the idea is that you can fix a, a distance between the initial state and your uh, a distance, and you can always find a time such that the initial state and the state at the time t is, are close to one another uh, within the error that you chose. That you chose. So indeed, and this is called the quasi periodicity. Here, the condition are that the, uh, we should have a fine, generally a finite number of uh, eigenstates, and we, the spectrum should be discrete. Then we can relax some con some of these conditions in particular cases, for example, for the harmonic oscillator. But okay, generally, if you have these two conditions, are enough to to say that the the the, the state is uh, quasi periodic. Exactly periodic, where you need the uh, general this. Here you can always consider shift. You can shift all the energy by some, uh, also the, also only, if you want here, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the important quantities are this one. So yeah. let's subtract the only energy difference makes sense. Okay, so we have to subtract the, for example, the energy of the ground state. Okay. So, well, so we learned here that. Uh, as long as we consider a finite number of degrees of freedom, the system is quasi-periodic. And uh, so maybe uh, after this, you could, uh, uh, you could start thinking that we cannot describe, for example, statistical physics well, just uh, by, uh, by studying the time evolution of pure states. Because there is a big difference between what we we see in uh, in statistical physics, so that, that there is some uh, time direction, so that there is the, the entropy, for example, increases. So you have something that the, uh, the, the state the time evolves; it, it doesn't come back to the original state. Instead, here I'm telling you that there is always this time where the state is exactly equal to the initial state. How how can you? Uh, <coughs> How can you go against this this paradox if you want? And the way is to consider the thermodynamic limit in general. So you have to uh, you have to break uh, some hypothesis, some assumption here, hmm, in order to have uh, some time evolution that doesn't come back to the initial state. If you want to see, if you want to describe some uh, uh, some non trivial, I would say some. Uh, some time evolution will resemble our idea of statistical uh, problems. Okay. And indeed, we'll see that uh, in the thermodynamic limit, all these kind of theorems uh, don't hold anymore. And we can have uh, uh, interesting, more interesting dynamics. OK, so uh, so this was just to give you an idea of time evolution. And now uh, let's. Uh, Let's come back to what we did the first lecture for a moment about the quantum measurements. Okay. So, uh, and because let's start uh, think what happens when you you perform measurements at different times. Okay. So the what I mean. Okay. The the idea is to. The idea is to prepare our initial state, our system in some initial state, say zero. Okay, this state is pure, for example, and so we can describe the state for using this density matrix. 
let's now assume that we we uh, measure some observable. Now you remember what I told you that after measurement, hmm, if I don't tell you the outcome, then the density matrix becomes equal to the sum. Uh, let's assume that we measure this observable, observable which is whose spectral decomposition is this one. So you have some eigenvalues, lambda, and here you have a project on this eigenstate, on the you know, state. Okay, so this is our observable. So the, the density metric is projecting on this operator, so n, n, row, n, n. You remember this? Hmm? So these are the projectors on the eigenspace space associated with a measure, with a, with a particular measurement, a particular outcome. And the density matrix, uh, after the measurement, is written in this form. You have the projector on the left and on the right, and so on. OK. So let's assume that uh, we, we, we take this measurement, and then we, we consider time evolution under some Hamiltonian. Hmm. So if you consider the time evolution of this density matrix, for h uh, independent of time, I show you before what is the the uh, did I uh, did I show you how the density matrix time evolves? No, I'm not sure. Maybe I, I didn't. Okay, maybe I forgot. A little bit. So, just a moment. Yep. So we have seen before that the state time evolves in this way. Hmm? No, let's not say T. What if we consider now the density matrix? The density matrix at the time t is equal to psi t, psi t, which is equal to e to the minus i h t, psi 0, psi 0, e to the i h t. So this is how the density matrix time evolves. If you're interested in the equation, that is satisfied by the density matrix of this one. So uh, h. Okay, so it's the same equation satisfied by the operators in the Eisenberg picture, but with the opposite sign. Okay, this is just because I forgot to tell you this. Okay, so, uh, well, this assuming that we are considering the density matrix of the entire system. Okay, so let's... Uh, uh, warning. Let's now assume that we are interested in the time evolution of a reduced density matrix. The, the reduced density matrix doesn't evolve in this way. Is it clear why? It has a more complicated time evolution. The time evolution here is simple because we are considering a, an isolated system. When you consider a, a subsystem, then the system is open. Okay, so you can't, you cannot expect to describe uh, the, the time evolution in this simple way with the, such an equation. And you can immediately see this if you want. So if you, okay. Let's let's see this. Uh, so let's assume that the, our Hamiltonian can be written as the sum of three terms. Okay, there is one term which checks only on the on the subsystem A, and uh, and X like the identity on the on the rest of the system. Then we have another term that instead X like the identity on the subsystem and like some non-trivial operator on the subsystem B. But then you can also have some terms which X on the on both A and B. So you can always write the Hamiltonian in this in this way. For example, if uh, uh, we consider the just uh, uh, the three spin, the, let's consider two spins, okay? And uh, with uh, the Hamiltonian sigma 1x, sigma 2x, plus sigma 1z, plus sigma 2z. Hmm? Then this term, x only on the first spin, so belong to this. This term, 
uh, exon 3 by oleum B, so it belongs to this. But then you have this term that coupled the two spin, so this is part of this. So, yeah, you can always decompose the emitter in this, in this way. Then, okay, uh, we know the, what is the, the time evolution of the total state, which is this one. So we, we can uh, take the trace of this equation over uh, the, uh, the subsystem B, for example. Okay. What happens when we take this trace? So here the trace over the subsystem B is just the, den the density metric of the subsystem A. So we have the, the, the <coughs> high derivative with respect to the time of the reduced density matrix of the subsystem A. Now we see equal to the trace over B of what? Here you have the commutator between H A plus H A is uh, with a row of T. Hmm. Now, when you consider this term, here you have the commutator between H A and B and rho, okay? And then you have a trace over B. H A doesn't act on B, so you can move the operator outside the trace. And so this, here you find that it's equal to H A comma rho A of T, and this is the first term. Then there is this term, and now you have that H acts on B, okay? So, but the, there is a commutator between H, B, and rho. Now, because you are tracing out over B, this term is equal to zero. The trace of the, you can convince yourself that it's equal to zero, the trace of the commutator. So this doesn't give any contribution. And then you, but you have also this term that we cannot simplify in any way. So trace over B of H, I, B, Rho of t. So, okay. So what's important here? You see that the, when you consider reduced density matrices, it's, you you cannot rewrite an equation using just rho a of t. You have also some other contribution. So the time evolution is highly non-trivial for reduced density matrices. Yeah. And this is uh, uh, related to the fact that the system, the subsystem, is not closed. There is interaction between A and B. And this is the interaction I'm talking about between the subsystem and the rest. OK. Questions about this? As long as the system is isolated and the Hamilton is conserved, we can use the Schrodinger equation or whatever, so these simple equations to describe time evolution. When we consider okay. this term, okay, we, let's see. So the second term is written as the trace over B. Hmm? Or now the trace over B, what is it? Is the sum, what is it? trace? Okay, we have trace. Over B of uh, we have here I A H B times rho minus H B A rho. This is what we have now. Now trace over B is written as the sum over a complete basis of states in the subsystem B. So we have a sum over all the state of psi and B of the same here. Yes, it's uh, oh, uh, yes, it's IA. Ah, but uh, there is rho here, sorry. Rho T is here. And then you have I, IA HB. This works because there is a commutator. So 
we write this. <coughs> rho t minus hp uh, rho t hp For example, we could, uh, just to see immediately the result, uh, as a this is an arbitrary basis, okay? We can choose a basis that diagonalizes the HP. Why not? Then you see that when you apply HP to this, you find the energy, the corresponding energy, but you find the same here. So this two term simplify and you find it. Anyway, but, uh, now, the, the exact expression is not important, just know that uh, it's, not simple, uh, it's not as simple as in the, uh, in the isolated case. Yeah. Can I? Oh, I, I leave it. So now, let's, uh, let's go back to what we were doing here. So the idea was to prepare the state, the system in the state psi not which is described by this density metric, which is the projector on the state. Then we consider a particular observable, generic observable, and then the idea is to, uh, is to take a measurement of this observable at the time zero. So now the density matrix is described by this <laughs> after the measurement. Yeah. H A B equals zero is an example. <laughs> H A B equals zero is if also in that case another nice example. <laughs> so, uh, uh, I I doubt. Okay, if there are cases, they are actually related to the particular state that you are considering. So, so you can write this kind of general equation for every state. So maybe if there are particular cases in which you find one. Okay. okay, so we were here, so we carry out this measurement. This is our state after the measurement. For example, it means the less we are considering this chain, and now we are computing, for example, the sigma z here in position. And we don't know the outcome, just uh, carry, we have this apparatus that uh, carry out these projective measurements. Then we follow the time evolution, okay? So the density matrix at the time t is equal to e to the minus i ht and this operator. Okay? Time evolution after the measurement. Then let's assume that we, we want to measure another observable hmm? after this time. So the new observable would be, okay, this was A1, let's say. So we have, uh, let's put some 1. Uh, this will be 1. This will be 1, 1. Okay. 1, 1, 1, 1. There we have 1, 1. And then we measure the observable O2. These are the other states of the other observable. So here we measure O1, and here we are measuring O2. So the new density matrix, again, okay, will be given by the sum of yeah, all these bases, M of M2, M2, e to the i minus a, i h t, 
n1 and 1 row and 1 and 1 there is some of m and n and n sorry okay so here we measured o1 then we time evolved down until the time t and then we measure another observable o2 and we are computing density matrix after the second measurement okay so what I have to do is to project on the on the eigenspace of the on the eigenspaces of the second uh, the second operator. So m here e to the i h t m two m two. So, just to give you an idea of what we are doing, so the, let's assume that this chain extends up to the, I don't know, some unknown planet. Yeah. And uh, the first measurement actually was done by this alien here. Okay. They did this measurement. And then after a while, we are here on the chart. Anyway. Okay, so, and we are measuring this observable here. After a time, this is O2 and this is O1. Yeah. No, okay, this I measure then zero time. The alien and measure this observable. And now I'm uh, considering time evolution. And after a time t, we are here and we measure something. Okay. And this is the density matrix. So after the alien measured the, the observable, then we got this. Mm. Then we evolve them for some time. And then we measure some observable. And we obtain this. Okay. <coughs> How can you rewrite this? Well, this can also be written as e to the minus i h t times sum over m and n of e to the i h t m m e to the minus i h t and you have here N, okay, here there is a 2, here there is a 2, and 1, and 1, then there is row, and 1, and 1, and then we have the same, okay, I saw the alien, okay, here we have uh, E to the I, H, T, M, 2, M, to e to the minus i h t e to the i h t is it clear what I'm doing all the steps at least what I am so first measurement o1 then time evolution for a time t then second measurement of o2 and this is what we find Okay, you see, this is kind of uh, complicated. No, it's rather complicated because okay, it depends on the eigenstates of the observable, uh, of the first observable, the eigenstates of the second observable, there is a time evolution. But now, well, we recognize here that the, this is the, the time evolution of an operator in the Eisenberg picture, no? right? So what I mean is that if we consider the time evolution of the second operator in the Eisenberg picture, this is just given by sum over n of lambda n2 d to the i h t m m hmm? right this is just the definition of the Eisenberg the time evolution of the operator in the Eisenberg feature and we see actually that this is exactly the same 
that that there are no eigenvalues because I, I uh, we we don't know the outcome of the measurement, especially because okay they were performed by alien very far away from here we cannot communicate with aliens, so there was just this measurement. We don't know what the outcome, and so this is the density matrix after this measurement. So now let's assume, this is now assumption, assumption that this operator here of 2 of t commutes with O1. So what happens? So what's the consequence? When two operators commute between one another, what can you find? You can find a common basis that diagonalizes both operators, right? So this means that we can actually choose here a basis, which is the same for this and this other operator. Okay. In other words, if you want, we can choose n, 1, to be exactly equal to e to the, uh, okay, let me, why there is this, a, uh, sorry, there's something that I don't, see uh, what's this for right? okay, I can write this n1, like e to the i h t, uh, check the signs, uh, I don't want to well, check whether they are correct, n, We can do this, no? We can impose this. Because we this is just the basis that diagonalizes the operators. If we assume that they that they commute, we can actually identify these two eigenvectors. Why not? But then what happens here? This was an ortho, ortho orthonormal basis. These are orthonormal. So this means that this scalar product is either equal to zero or one depending on whether n is equal to m or n is different from m. So this means that finally your density matrix becomes e to the minus i h t, and you have sum over m of e to the i h t m2, m2, because this is equal to m2, uh, e to the i h t, row, e to the i h t, m2, m2, e to the minus i h t, everything times e to the i h t. So under this assumption, this is a Kronecker delta, so I can choose n equal to this, e to the i h t n, and everything in this. Please simplify. What is this? This is the density matrix after the, the measurement of uh, O2 after the time t. So if you measure O2 at the time t, you find this density matrix. No information anymore about the the operator O1, we have lost everything. So this means that we, unfortunately, we cannot infer from our measurements whether aliens exist or not. So you see that the, if the, these operators commute, then independently of what happens here, hmm, or the measure o, of, or the fact that you measure some observable O, then you, uh, the density matrix is the same after the second measurement if they commute, if O1 commute with O2 of t, okay? Questions?
Okay. So you see that uh, uh, it is useful to consider this kind of quantity because well, if there are situations when we can, uh, um, if there is some theory that tells us that two observers commute are, or almost commute, then we can infer that the, the two, that measuring the two quantities are completely uh, independent. So you are, uh, you are unaffected by the measurements of the first observer if you wait for time t, okay? If this condition is satisfied. So what you, So what I propose is to consider uh, the models that we studied again, in the last week and see what happens, just see what happens if we compute the commutator between uh, in observers in a given position at a time zero, like for example in the harmonic chain, let's consider the quantum, quantum harmonic chain. So we could compute something like the commutator between the position of the J ions, the displacement of the J ions, and for example, the, oh, why did I compute? Um, and, uh, I can compute this at the time t. and the momentum of the of yes, of the L ion. So what does it mean here? So this means that uh, uh, we know that if these two commutes, it means that if I measure the momentum of the L ion, and then after a time t, I measure the position of the J atom, then I don't, I'm not affected by the first measurement if this is equal to zero. So the idea is to see, well, just compute it, try to see uh, what we find. And uh, how can we compute these quantities in our system? <coughs> so let's, uh, uh, let's write the definition of the time evolution of x in the asymptote feature. So you have that x, x, j, j of t is equal to e to the i h t x j e to the minus i h t. Okay? This is the Hamiltonian of the harmonic oscillator. And uh, well, but write, uh, let's write this Hamiltonian in terms of the uh, ladder operator we define here, so we have that it's equal to the exponential of i, then we have a term like p squared divided by 2mn, then we have plus sum over k of epsilon of k, a dot k, a k. Clearly the constant is, uh, uh, is irrelevant because it's simplified, mm -hmm. as, as we should. So we have this times x, j, and then the same with the minus sign. Exactly. Now the, the idea is to rewrite x in terms of the uh, of this ladder operators here. Yeah. The operators are created phonons or destroy phonons. And we compute the expression last time, right? So we wrote that, let's write it again. That the, uh, where is it? We have, let's see. Okay. okay. 
last week we found this expression x j hmm, is equal to the sum well, n from 1 to capital N minus 1 of e to the minus 2 pi n j over capital N 1 over square root of 2 m capital N omega sine of pi n over capital N i a capital N minus n minus a dot n plus We have this, <coughs> and now we have to compute the, this kind of operator, the, this kind of time evolution of this operator. Okay. So we have to consider term by term. Sorry? No, in the definition of x, uh, there is capital X. Otherwise, this is not the right operator. So this is the, this is the, the position of the central mass. We consider when we consider the correlation, we subtract it, but for the variable, the coordinate is this one, the position variable. So we have this, and now we are interested in the time evolution. How do we do it? <coughs> we use the algebra, just the algebra of the operator, as always. So we remember these commutation relations. A k, A d k. It of cool Q is equal to delta KQ, AK, AQ is equal to zero. Then we have that X, B is equal to I, and we have that all the other commutation are equal to zero. So we want just to use this. So let's consider, for example, this contribution from capital X over here, here. So the time evolution of X in the Eisenberg pitch, X of T in the Eisenberg pitch. So this means, let's put this operator here. Yeah. A dag A commute with this, with this X, where it's written there. This A dag A commute with P, okay. So this means that all this term can be can be moved to the right of the operator and it's simplified. So you end up just with uh, this part, e to the i t squared over 2 m capital N, x e to the minus i t squared over 2 m capital N. In this, I told you last time that the uh, X and P are completely decoupled from the rest, from the other operator. So you can just consider the time evolution under the free part, uh, the, the, the free time evolution. Hmm? How do you compute this? Any idea? And uh, how do you see that there is a commutator here? Why? It's, it's correct. Uh, just asking. Okay, and uh, and so you are suggesting to use the particular identity, which is the following. So. If you have to consider the exponent e to the i, generic h t, this is generic, observe e to the minus i h t, how can you write this? Just expanding the, the exponential, what you find is that this is equal to o plus uh, i h o, commutator, plus i Let's write in this way, IH plus IH 
I H O plus I H I H I H O plus and so on. So you see this is like the expansion of the exponential. So you have one over n factorial, and here you have to compute n commutators between the Hamiltonian and the operators. Yeah? Everywhere there is an i. Right? Yeah, this is correct, I guess, no? Ah, the time, ah, the time, no i, the time. Okay, yes, you're right, that's the time. Uh, well, we can use some uh, shortcut, I don't know, or some notation, I don't know. How can you uh, write this like? Uh, if you understand what I mean. So you write the expansion of these commutators. Well, it's just that for uh, some notation to indicate this kind of series. So we can do the same here, no? We know the commutator between P and X, so what do we find? Okay, the first commutator, we have to compute commutator between I, the square over 2, M, N, and X. So we have the constant I over 2, M, N, times the commutator between P and X, yeah, using the, the, the trick that I told you last week, times the derivative of p, so you have times 2 p, which is equal to uh, 1 over m capital N times x. Okay? Hmm? This is the first term of the series. Then we should consider the other term. The other term when we have i squared over 2 m n. Oh, sorry, that's p here. Yeah. Uh, no, it's not p. OK. Then we have to consider the other term. So the commutator between this, again, the Hamilton, and this term, and this commutator here. But now this commutator is, is proportional to p. And the computer between p squared and p is equal to 0. So we find 0. And then if we consider all the other, uh, all the other elements of the series expansion are equal to 0 because of this. So in other words, we can just uh, we can, we can, uh, we can truncate the series expansion up to what, just the first order. Yeah, we have all the terms. So this means that uh, the, this means that this is equal to x, which is the zero order, when you expand the, 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 when you expand the exponential at the, at the zero order, like 1, and then you have plus what we wrote there, p, oh, there is a time here, sorry, I forgot the time, mm -hmm. plus p, t, over m, n, is correct? Are we surprised about this result? We are just saying that the, uh, a free particle uh, moves according to. So it's, uh, no, you shouldn't be so surprised no, about this result. So, but it's okay. We obtain this uh, kind of trivial result uh, using quantum mechanics. So, so you should be happy. Okay, so we see that the, 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 the term solution of this term is simple, just a free particle moving and mo with momentum P over capital N. And then uh, what about the other terms? Now we have to compute the time evolution of this, of this operator. But it's simple, it should be simple as well, because well, we 
otherwise we didn't introduce this operator if it wasn't zero. So we, uh, the Hamiltonian is diagonal in this basis, so we have to compute the exponential of, of i p epsilon k sum over k of epsilon k b dot, no, sorry, a, a dot k a k t, okay, is there, uh, uh, then there is f, uh, there is this term, the generic a n, for example, that, okay. and then here we have the exponential of minus i t sum over k epsilon k a dot k a k. Okay, I, I dropped this, this part because p square commutes with a. So as before, it simplifies. We have to compute this. Again, we have to write a commutator between this term and the a dot n. What is the commutator? So we have to compute the commutator between <coughs> i t sum over k of epsilon k a dot k a k and a dot m, n, this is the first term. First of all, all these terms, but k equal n, commute with the a dot n. So this is equal to i t epsilon of uh, n. Okay. And then we have here a commutator between a dot n, a n, and a dot n. What is this? This is equal to i t epsilon of n, a dot n, computator between a n and a dot n, which is equal to i t epsilon of n, a dot n. Okay. Or is it clear what I did here? Hmm? I use that committed A, B, and C is equal A, B, C plus A, C, B. I use the event. Okay, so this is what we found. And now, okay, the next step would be to compute again the commutator between this and the result. But now you see that the result is proportional to the original one. So in other words, if, you, if I call this uh, W, we, pro, we show that W with A dot N is equal to I T epsilon N A dot N. So this means now if we compute the commutator between W and this, what we find? We find I T epsilon n squared applied to A dot n, and so on. Every commutator that we apply, we just have to multiply this number by I T epsilon n. So in the end, what we find is that E to the, I call this W, so E to the W, a again e to the minus w is equal to e to the i i t epsilon n a again. So the time evolution of this this ladder operator is uh, very simple. Hmm? They just time evolve. Some, some evolve with a, with a phase. Oh, there is, yes, there is a time. <clears throat> now, if you, if you consider the conjugate of this, you also find the time evolution of an. And what you find is that e to the w, an e to the minus w, is equal to e to the minus i t epsilon n h again. Oh, right, sorry, AN. Okay, so now we have all the ingredients to compute the 
time evolution of, uh, of x. Then I erase here, the board, the right one. So what we find is that x j of t in the isomer picture is equal to uh, we rewrite this this term here and now we replace the operators with a time evolving with a time evolution in the isomer picture. So we replace x by this and we replace this a by them selfies times the the phases. Okay. So XJRT is equal to sum from n from 1 to capital N minus 1 of e to the minus 2 pi j n over capital N 1 over square root of 2n not 2m capital N omega omega sine of pi n over capital N times i, then we have e to the minus i t, and then we should consider the energy of capital N minus n, which is equal to sine of pi n over capital N, a n capital N minus n minus e to the i t sine of pi n over capital N A dot N plus X plus P T over M capital N. Okay, the structure of this uh, of this equation is general. So every time that you have uh, some linear combination of the ladder operator and or uh, yes, of the ladder operator or the fermionic operator in the easing chain, okay, and the and the Hamiltonian is quadratic in these operators, then you will find that the, the time evolution of this operator is still a linear combination of the original bosonic or fermionic operators, like in this case. In other words, the time evolution under quadratic Hamiltonian preserves the number of, of particles. So if you have here two particles, two A, then you end up with two A's. It doesn't increase the number of particles. This is how you see that uh, the time evolution is not interacting. Sorry. Because it doesn't decrease the number of particles. You are not, you are not allowing decay, decay or creation of particles. Okay, so we found this expression, and uh, well, let's also write the expression for PL, the momentum. This is the just the expression that we computed last time, which is equal, uh, which is given by. Find it. P was equal to sum over n. Omega psi pi n over capital N divided by two capital N a dot n plus a dot a capital N minus n plus p over n. Okay, and this was what we computed last time. 
So we have both the operator at the time t and the momentum time zero. And what we want. now what to do is to compute the commutator between x and p. I give you four means. Okay. Let me because I didn't give you. Hmm? Why so? We start at half past two, no? And so it's a, it's a quarter past. No. No, it's a, no, no, it started from half past two. Oh, it's not two hours. Oh. Ah. Okay. Mm. Mm, so then we finish it. Okay. So. Okay. Yeah. Is okay. Now, if you compute this commutator, it's kind of simple now because you know how to compute the commutator between these operators and the other ones. You know that the only term different from zero is when the indices are the same, mm -hmm. and one is uh, a creation operator, and the other is the destruction operator. So what do you find uh, if, uh, okay, uh, assuming that I'm, uh, assuming that there are no typos here. So what I found, let's see, is that xj in the Eisenberg pitch, the time t commutator of p l Eisenberg, oh, Eisenberg, PL hmm, is equal to I over capital N sum over N from 0 to capital N minus 1 cosine of 2 pi N J minus L divided by capital N cosine of omega sine of pi N over capital N of Yes, capital N T. Hmm? And now if you take the limit n goes to infinity in this expression, you find that this is equal to this approach is the I times the Bessel function to L, uh, J minus L omega. Okay, clearly we have no idea what is a Bessel function. No, it's, it's just a special function. But I, I just plot the behavior, hmm? the approximate behavior of this function, if I remember it. Uh, okay, I hope so. Uh, so it's something like this. So, yeah. Now I plot. <coughs> J to N of um, okay J to N of omega t as a function of omega t. Oh, I'm not sure here. Mm, it's not. Uh, okay, I would say. Let me say this. So okay, this is zero. Hmm? We start from zero. It's very close to zero. Then it becomes larger, and this behaves like. Maybe I wrote it here. Let me check. Yes, this behaves like. Like omega t over. Okay, that's right. The behavior here is like omega t over two to the two n. 1 over uh, 2n factorial. So you see that this is extremely small hmm, for large n. And moreover, that this is a very large power of t. Yeah. So it's almost flat. Yeah. And you see that it becomes different from 0 when it, it is close to, close to n, I guess. Okay. And then it starts doing like this. And it approaches zero like one of the roots of, uh, of omega t. I think. What
what do we learn from this? So we learn that there is, if you consider the small times, short times with respect to the distance of the two operators, practically the two operators commute. They are commuting. As long as they, as the, the time is sufficiently, sufficiently uh, uh, small. And then when the time becomes of the order of the distance, then well, the commutator becomes different from zero. So you start feeding the two operators. In other words, there is a, <coughs> there is what we call a light cone behavior. Light cone. And it means that we, let us assume this is our chain, mm -hmm. and this is the time. We started measuring the, uh, in this case, for example, the operator PL here. And then at the given time, we, we measure, here yeah, at this time, we measure the operator X, J. This is J, and this is L. What happens is that if the time is smaller than the distance, then you don't see the two observer commute. So you don't see the effect of the other. So from here, you can, when you consider the time evolution, <coughs> you can actually draw a kind of light cone starting from the operator. And you can be sure that if you are outside the light cone, this operator commutes with this. If you are outside the light cone. So again, like it relative. I don't know if you. What is surprising here that we are considering non-relativistic models. Hmm? Okay, maybe. And okay, we find this for the harmonic oscillator. And uh, well, tomorrow we'll see that we find the same behavior for the quantum easing model. And then I'll tell you that this is actually general. Okay. In, at least in, uh, uh, as long as we consider spin chains or uh, Kind of this is uh, well. I'm using here only the thermodynamic. I mean the thermodynamic limit. I don't need it. Right? Uh, why large time? You, you will have. You have this like also at large time. Yes, but also at uh, at short times. You. No, no, but then, okay, this means that the, your time is very, very large. So you, uh, it decreases uh, as a power law, 1 over t, 1 alpha. Instead, here you have an extremely large power law. Moreover, you have a dependence from distance, which was like 1 over n factorial, faster than exponential, equals to 0, faster than exponential, exponential with the distance. So, so uh, this light one comes from the uh, the bosons that diagonalize the model, which have a finite velocity, maximal velocity. So the information between one point and the other is uh, is carried by these particles that move. But if you are outside the light, it means that no particle has reached that point. And so you. Yeah. I mean, uh, if I want to calculate the slope of this O, so the slope of this line, yes. uh, the ratio of P over M is uh, uh, what you have to do is to compute the, the velocity of the excitations, which is the derivative of epsilon with respect to the momentum, and you consider the maximal value. So this is the, max, the, the fastest particle. Because you cannot, uh, well, uh, if you are outside, the a space that can be reached by the fastest particle means that the correlation should be very, very small. So I wasn't able to. Uh, so it's right there, yeah.